Surely Supersonic will be more stable this time around. I just can't catch a break. Tis the season to be a Sonic fan, I guess, where not one, but two fully completed fan games have come out within a short time span. And they're good! It's very important detail. Here's hoping the company who owns the character can pitch in soon. Noah N. Copeland is the man responsible for the 16-bit remake of Sonic Triple Trouble, originally a Game Gear exclusive title locked at a lower frame rate, screen resolution, half the bits, and like 4,000 springs. Now, we live in an era where the entertainment field is a bit saturated with remakes, perhaps to a fault, but this is one instance where I think it's fully justified. Taking a game that was severely limited by hardware restrictions and releasing it from those shackles into a new world of possibility, a world with less tubes. I know I compared PO6 to AM2R, but this is a far more accurate analogy. The whole project is a lucid what-if concept brought to life. What if Triple Trouble was instead released for the Sega Genesis as a sequel to Sonic 3? That's the question Noah and his team dared to answer. And yeah, it's pretty good. The sights and sounds are all spot on, and the story even takes place right after the events of 3. Like, immediately after. Knuckles has a short intro level at Angel Island to get to the ending cutscene where he says goodbye. And within moments, Sonic is duking it out with a big arm and loses the emeralds yet again. You need help. If you are at all a fan of Sonic 3's storytelling, you're gonna be pleased by what you see, especially towards the end where certain reveals are made, transformations occur, it's a fun time. The only weird quirk is that there's no ending cutscene. Sonic's like, yeah, I won. And then the credits roll. No charming epilogue or possible cliffhanger, it just ends. Very odd considering how detailed the opening was. Knuckles doesn't even show up on his credits. I guess he's got better things to do, like sitting around. Up to that point though, it's fantastic. Even outside of the cinematics, we have flourishes like Tails wearing the typical scared expression while riding these mudslides, whereas Sonic will be on his feet with confidence, showing the contrast in their characters. Knuckles is just angry though, he never wants to be where he is. In the giant bubbles, Tails is upside down, confused and worried, but Sonic is upright, patiently waiting for the nightmare to end. When the fire shield is equipped, it melts the large bodies of background snow and leaves a small flame trail behind at high speeds. Although you still get frozen by the the machine. Maybe change that for a cool continuity detail. You pulverize Fang into the ground after each encounter to assert dominance. You are nothing to me! These minute ingredients go a long way to pepper the adventure with personality. In general, the game has a strong commitment to set pieces. From momentary gimmicks like the minecarts and rocket shoes to a snowboarding minigame, to full bonus acts like the Egg Zeppelin and the Sea Fox submarine. It routinely shakes things up to be in your face like never before. All right, fellas. Most famously is the extended train segment. One part auto-scroller, another part level, and run for your life. This is the one area that I think Sonic 3 gets trumped in. All the classics, for that matter. This sort of periodic deviation in gameplay was rarely seen on the big console releases, outside of optional content like special stages. You had Sky Chase, but it was usually quick automated sections like the airship, snowboard, or jumping into the egg mobile. I must become egg. You could tell they felt more comfortable experimenting with these on the handheld spin-offs that would be under inherently less scrutiny. And one could argue that there was a good reason for that. Perhaps these are a bit distracting from the main gameplay, overstaying longer than necessary. I felt some fatigue in the submarine level. It started great, but the innovation began to peter out by the end as it devolved into find switch and kill enemy that doesn't move. I loved the DKC vibes it was given me and that rings are used as a health bar, but it doesn't ramp up enough to warrant such a long visit. I think a space shooter type section where you kill a gauntlet of incoming enemies would have been a perfect fit here. I think I may prefer Knuckles version. It's faster since he doesn't need to press switches and they gave him the air necklace, best game. Maybe if the snowboard embraced its arcadey roots and gave more opportunities to score massive points and lives, it would stimulate more thoughtful replays for those who don't care much for auto-scrollers. A Sonic-only mode would be great too, because I don't think Tails can take much more of this. And as much as I love the train, I think it could have been paced more like Mania's. Not as short, heavens no, but faster with more diverse interactions. I'm looking at a lot of brown here, a lot of the same slopage and enemies, or lack thereof. I kept jumping down these pits to try and find a secret, but to no avail. How about going inside some of the cars? Go, or hopping from one train cart to the next before it separates. Even Fang's antagonisms fall on deaf ears initially. It's a great idea to have a boss attack you from the foreground, but he only fires once. He takes his sweet time aiming at you and then runs away after one failure. You know, for someone called Fang the Sniper, you're kind of a lousy shot. It gets better inside when he tries shooting you while moving, but his first attempt is such a flash in the pan, there are a lot of ways this could have come back stronger. Like using multiple reticles on screen at once, then firing one at a time. Don't be afraid to unload a full clip onto 
to us in one go, we are men and ready to die. Or during the end of the fiery escape, he could come back for one last assault. This would have you dodging the fire and the bullets simultaneously in a grand final challenge. I get that it's only the second zone and you don't want to create a difficulty spike, but it pulls its punches a little too much for my tastes, leaving some parts more barren. I found it more exciting to replay as Knuckles since you can get some pretty long glides in here, but that joy comes at the price of skipping content. I love the beginning and end, it just needs to fill in places, and I am facing the wrong way. Same with the Egg Zeppelin, it's a great addition, adds a lot of character that the original didn't have. Even the Sky Chase callback is good, but if they wanted to go that double extra mile and turn it into a partially full act like Wing Fortress having more secrets and pathways, I would be down, like what they did with the hidden purple palace you can find. It's a miniature stage that doesn't compete with the other zones, but it has some density to it. And dinosaurs. I only wish it had a substitute boss at the end, because coming here makes you miss out on the wicked penguin fight. Look how cool he is. Like always, I nitpick out of love, I just want to see these games be the best versions of themselves. In the end, it's these exact set pieces that allow Triple Trouble to stand out from the classics. And I welcome them. Other than that, it's traditional Sonic as we know him. Graphically, it looks straight out of Sonic 3. Sometimes maybe a bit too much, albeit grittier in its textures. You can tell this was adapted from a Game Gear title with its, at times, more modest industrial palette and a lavish recycling of past level tropes. Great Turquoise and Meta Junglira both feel like extensions of Angel Island. Sunset Park has chemical plant vibes, Robotnik Winter speaks for itself. Tidal Plant is like an underwater launch base. And Atomic Destroyer has some serious Death Egg energy. What? Mind you, I'm not bothered by this, but had Triple Trouble been released as the next mainline title, I doubt Sonic Team would have reused so many assets in good conscience. We can see how the trilogy evolved artistically, Sonic 2 cranking up the saturation and 3 increasing the details. So it's safe to assume that a fourth entry would have spruced up the presentation in some way to be more cutting edge as well as original, like what Knuckles Chaotix or 3D Blast would do. We also only have approximately 7 zones if we round up, compared to 3 and K's 11.5 a rather significant chunk of runtime I don't think they would have been too keen on losing. I only bring this up because a lot of people are saying that this feels like an official sequel, and while I don't disagree, don't expect this to feel like one in the same way that going from 2 to 3 did, where the gap in quality and vision was clear as day. Think of it more like how Sonic and Knuckles complemented Sonic 3. A necessary second half, or in this case, a hypothetical final act we didn't know we needed. Full disclosure, I haven't played the original Triple Trouble, so I won't be highlighting what was and wasn't adapted from it, I'm gonna treat this like its own entity to keep things simple. Unless it's something that I know for a fact wasn't here before, like the unexpectedly great prologue Zone Zero. It's quietly ambient, no music, just the droning sound of a storm as if we booted up Super Metroid by accident. Then the final weapon shows up and you go super with the music, oh it's perfect. This is also where you learn that you can swap between Sonic and Tails at any time like heroes. Quite the game changer I gotta say, rather than selecting which one you want and dealing with their respective pros and cons. You can just have both. It's surprisingly well balanced around it too. There were some parts that only Tails could reach, and more than ever, I found myself playing as the wee lad since I didn't have to dedicate an entire file to him. All right, buddy, here we- Oh. Being able to cancel his flight makes an equally big difference, as it was the slow descent and inability to bounce on enemies during it that often deterred me from giving him a fair shot. There are still a couple segments that he can break, where you can tell there's a very intended way of going through, and he's like, but what if I didn't? Sometimes, literally breaking, you're supposed to watch Fang go through this tunnel from underneath, but if you fly, something in the scripting goes wrong and he shows up late. I guess he really had somewhere to be. Oh, he really had somewhere to be. How did you... We not going to talk about this, fellas? So yeah, Tails doesn't always accommodate the- He's still going? Careful when swapping, too. If you take damage as one character and then switch over, the invincibility frames don't. Check this out. I jumped onto this platform as Sonic, and then wanted to swap to Tails so I could fly off of it. But I didn't know it was going to move, so I switched before Tails landed, unintentionally walking off the edge as it darted away. Then tried to switch back to Sonic since he was above me, but got hit, delaying the swap until after I lost all my rings. So now Sonic has changed positions, falling without any frames and land straight into the grid. Tails get out of the fire. I'm not even mad about this. I just wanted to share that Rube Goldberg machine of a disaster. I do think having the option of a Sonic or Tails solo mode is still ideal for the sake of preference and not hearing two characters jump constantly.
when will it stop? But I like what they've done here. It's probably the most defining trait the core gameplay has over its predecessors. In addition to this, Sonic has the drop dash, a mainstay at this point, and yes, it can be activated after hitting a spring. The strike dash, in other words, a super peel out with a bit of invulnerability at the start. The gold shield replaces the default one, letting you do a homing attack. However, the insta shield does not make a return, as he thought it would be a bit overkill, and I could see that. A quality of life feature I really appreciate is an on-screen meter when you get invincibility or speed shoes. You also get a random bonus when crossing the Act 1 panel, a fun spin on the typical result screen. Capsules behave like normal, though. Sonic. Sonic, you can stop jumping, the war is over. An idea for a future game would be to give the player a better reward that scales with the amount of rings you cleared with. Or a Mario 2 style slot machine where you pay rings to try and get extra lives and shields. Now, before I go any further with utterly praising the rest of this project, I do have to get across my single greatest and only real complaint about it. First, there is a touch of input lag. You may not be able to tell on its own, but with Sonic 3 side by side or any of the others, something will feel off specifically when jumping. Typically, you can expect about a zero to one frame delay for jumping to occur after the input. Here, it's three frames, sometimes two. Now, that is far from the worst offender. You might even think, wow, that's minor. What's wrong with you? Fair point. It is a small problem, but one that can be felt constantly, even if I am pretty used to it by now. The spin dash sound effect also plays a whole six frames before the animation starts when normally they're synced up. That threw me off a bit. Roll locking was a problem at launch, but while I was writing this, the madman released a patch making it into a toggle, so never mind. And lastly, the physics are not a one-to-one -one replication of the Genesis. They're very close, but certain things are different. When going up a slope, naturally gravity pushes back and going down picks up speed. We're all familiar with this concept by now, and this does happen in Triple Trouble, but then you get these moderate angles where your weight is totally unaffected. Going up and down is identical. It's freaking me out, man. Midair control can be stiffer than usual. Go into one of the pinball bonus stages and you'll see what I mean right away. But then sometimes the opposite occurs and it becomes incredibly easy to juggle yourself on a boss. Red springs don't always launch you into orbit like we're used to. The strike dash does not convey a sense of speed, it's very underwhelming visually. Rolling doesn't always carry the same degree of momentum, what would send me flying in any of the other games might actually slow me down here. You can see it happen in real time, how the flow randomly dies when hugging certain corners. And I think it's this subtle change in how Sonic interacts with terrain that causes the general speed to feel sluggish at times. Not a deal breaker, but a recurring dissatisfaction when I see it. These games have a very particular feel to them where even subtle changes can throw off the synergy. Given that roll locking was patched though, it gives me hope that this may befall a similar fate. Or that I'm clinically insane. Whatever the case, I hope something happens eventually because we may have a contender for top 5 2D Sonic games. It just gets it. The opening is a 16-bit render of a Genesis being loaded up with the cartridge. This is a product made from love. I mean, the menus feel good to navigate. The sound effects, making a selection is responsive, the background looks like Sega box art brought to life, and look at this. A 4x3, 16x9 toggle built right into the options. With one flick of the D-pad, Origins Classic Mode is given the finger. There's a multiplayer campaign with its own story attached. Eggman looks demonic here, it's like he vacuum packed the head of a burnt sausage. It's a little broken right now, D-pad doesn't work, and jump height fluctuates with your direction, because that sounds fun. But it's extra content, and I know it's being worked on, so... I can wait. Beating the game unlocks Knuckles, who like before gets his own unique routes and a couple boss fights. But he also misses out on some, and he can't collect Chaos Emeralds, so that's kind of a bummer. His playthrough was also the one where I ran into the most issues. Getting hit by off-screen enemies, I mean this happens plenty for Sonic, but it was more annoying here. Some jumps were just out of range that you could tell they weren't made with his shorter jump height in mind. And these crushing blocks... What is that? Of course, it was still very fun. The Angel Island prologue was a great surprise, and clearing the game as him unlocks Metal Sonic. Once again, giving Origins the finger. He's got a cool hover that damages enemies in exchange for a few of Sonic's abilities. And collecting all the emeralds will let you play as Fang, equipped with a triple jump and a few pistol shots. Unfortunately, these two can only be used in free play. No story mode for them, which means no super form, true final boss, nor can you play all stages back to back. I can understand not wanting to create a unique campaign for a bunch of extra characters, but I don't think letting Metal play special stages and go super in a copy of Sonic's story would require much effort beyond making making a sprite sheet for the transformation. Not that it's easy, I'm just saying he doesn't have to make a brand new campaign with accommodations. Same goes for Fang. He, uh, why am I down here? Is this retribution? Did Knuckles actually hammer me into the earth? Oh, 
I get it. He's called Knack the Weasel in America, so this is like a weasel hole. Teaching you to use his jump to get out, and this is totally just a glitch, isn't it? Yeah, glitches are inevitable when making a game, but like with Fallen Star, I didn't encounter anything too disruptive. They were mainly funny collision mishaps, like I showed you. Pardon me, miss. It cost me a life here and there, like the wind not catching me as supersonic. You lied to me. And some hit detection is in serious question. What is this, wave ocean? But the general gameplay feels very polished outside of my gripes with the physics. The level design in particular being kind of insane with how accurately it emulates Sonic 3's approach. This was made by people who fervently understand the appeal of that game. It's not quite Mania's level of expertise, I think Triple Trouble is more congested in areas and gimmicky by choice, which we've established can go both ways for people, but Man, does it do a good job. Great Turquoise is like if Angel Island adopted the Green Hill philosophy of top, middle, and bottom routes. You have three distinct ways of getting through Act 1 that all intertwine at various points, with Act 2 throwing some compulsory movement-based gimmick into the mix. The whole thing has a great flow. And even after my ten or so completions of this opening zone, I'm still discovering new secrets tucked away that fill my kleptomaniac brain with the utmost glee. Sunset Park is the chemical plant of this game, the double helix roadways and accentuated roller coaster thrills are abundant. Beetle Carts. Yeah, he's got my vote. But like the best speed-focused levels, it knows how to scratch the player's brain in little ways to prevent stagnation. Take the three mechanics that make you ascend. One is a moving platform where you have to get on and off at the right time. The ones with springs, adding an extra layer to that timing, reducing your agency over it. And the handles that move up the wall on their own once grabbed. These all effectively achieve the same result of bringing you higher, but how you process each interaction is slightly different. On one, you're simply waiting. Another, you're anticipating your bounce height relative to your destination, and the other sends you into a horizontal direction rather than straight up. Exceptionally minor differences, yes, but they're frequent, which means your mind is always adapting to some kind of change. It also uses a wrecking ball as a set piece. That's pretty metal. Meta Junglira was actually my least favorite zone on my first playthrough, mainly because I was still fumbling around with the controls. Okay, buddy. But now it might be in the better half. Act 1 reminded me of Mushroom Hill with its wooden forest motif, perfect blend of speedy segments and platforming, and tall vertical heights to discourage falling. Even Act 2, which gave off Sandopolis vibes initially, is still fast-paced with its ever-changing slew of booby traps, mudslides, and cleverly hidden secrets. Plus an extended escape sequence at the end. We are going to die. But my favorite stage, without question, was Robotnik Winter. It has it all. High speed, really high speed, careful platforming, secrets galore, vertical shortcuts, cute environment appropriate gimmicks, whoa knuckles, elemental interactions, a snowboarding mini game, a snowboard and regular gameplay, a secret easter egg zone, seals and penguins, my will to live. This is how you do it ladies and gentlemen. In fact, I'm gonna say it. This is just better ice cap. Act 2 was great, absolutely, but Act 1? Outside of the music and iconic intro, it's a completely linear, indoor tower climb with minimal speed. It's not bad, it's just nothing special. Robotnik Winter is special in its entirety and has become one of my new favorite zones, period. So pat yourselves on the back, Noah, and... this. You created something that rivals Sonic Team in their prime and even exceeds that in a few areas. Tidal Plant is a water stage, but like the best of them, there's a way to skip most of it by taking the right routes. Although the shortcut isn't the secret passageway hiding in the wall, it's the bubble switch right before it with all the rings grabbing your attention. That felt kind of backwards to me. But the rest is pretty fun, even some of the underwater bits aren't too bad. Except one time where I revved a spin dash on a collapsing platform that dropped me into a sinkhole, locked in the animation until death do us part. Oh, I didn't hit a checkpoint. Interestingly, my favorite part about it is actually its placement. For some reason, Sonic's water levels are always put towards the beginning of the game. Labyrinth was over the halfway mark, although it was planned to be the second zone in development before they came to their senses. But then Tidal Tempest is just under the halfway point. Sonic 2 double whammies us with Aquatic Ruin also at the third zone, and Chemical Plant's notorious drowning segment right before it. And then Sonic 3 straight up makes it the second zone as if to fulfill the original Labyrinth vision. Actually, the opening zone, Angel Island, has water that you can drown in. I'm kind of glad there were no more Genesis sequels. They would have just started you underwater. You'd think that given the PTSD-inducing insta-kill nature of drowning, they would position it towards the end where the difficulty goes up. Instead, Sonic Team said, no, 
We want our players to scream. Clearly the Game Gear guys had the right idea because I think Title Plant is right where it should be. Things run at a lower pace to make room for deadlier hazards while still throwing in the occasional joyride. It's a shame there's only one act of it. As cool as the submarine is, it doesn't have the most elaborate gameplay attached. Also, you can grind this respawning enemy for 10,000 points, which I know is like, who cares? But for the one guy doing score attack, it would be considerate to keep the system balanced. Aside from that, it's a great segue into the grand finale at Atomic Destroyer. Certainly one of the better final zones, I'd say a solid runner-up to Death Egg and Titanic Monarch. It's a tad sparse in some areas, I don't feel as though its various gimmicks were fully realized. Even in somewhere like Scrap Brain, it was easy to tell what the main attractions were. But here, it's not so obvious or particularly original due to some recycled mechanics. Is that a penguin shaped like a bullet? <laughs> What have you done? That is until Act 2, where it throws you into a mega gauntlet of three isolated incremental challenges. One part has you dodging saw blades and other lasers on a timer and good old crushing blocks. Thanks to stronger theming, it gives each mechanic more space to breathe. Even if it's still quite simple at the end of the day, stuff like waiting for pistons to move isn't the most exciting. Oh yeah, dude, I love sitting still, it at least makes an effort to put some pressure on me. Clearing all three parts will send you into the final elevator climb, where it attempts to crush and knock you back into the pits it creates. I could see this haunting a few childhoods back in the 90s. Kudos for actually getting me killed twice by legitimate means, although dying makes you restart the climb, emphasizing how mundane the whole thing really is. I won't lie, there is some genuine tension to not fall off during the mini-boss, but the journey leading up to it doesn't have quite enough going on to justify its time sink. Less crushing and more enemies, I feel, would have led to a more entertaining auto-scroller. Either way, things end on a great note with an evolutionary take on Sonic 3's Doomsday Zone, should you happen to get all the Chaos Emeralds. Triple Trouble's bosses are hit or miss, to be honest. You get some cool ones every now and again, like the turtle that you jump on by using the logs. The penguin with its tricky jumps. The underwater Knuckles machine is fun to wail on, even if extremely easy. Knuckles' version of it is even better, since it has you going for the weak point. Followed by an equally fun sky battle against Metal Sonic. The rocket shoe controls help differentiate it, and you can score a couple hits per cycle, if you time it right. The elevator mini-boss is quick and sinister, like I said, and the final boss had some neat struggles. Phase 1 is a self-aware joke, but Phase 2 is deceptively hard to not get hurt. And Phase 3 is a take on the Sonic 1 final zone, where your greatest enemy is your own patience. Everything else, though, is either too basic, repetitive, or too long. All of Fang's encounters feel like worse versions of Eggman machines we've already fought. The drill car, but there's no drill. The spring yard platform destroyer, but he doesn't destroy anything. That twin spike robot from launch base, but there's only one spike now. He bounces to try and throw you off, but it's a little late in the game to start getting interesting. It also feels like the same boss three times with one minor change. Just, just quit now, Fang. You're, you've already lost, okay? little more, and euthanize. Knuckles is the same way. Both have nearly the same moveset, only instead of throwing bombs from the wall, he does it from the background. It's a cool effect, but now I'm stuck here waiting for the attack to finish, something I went into greater detail on in the Fallen Star review. He's invulnerable for most of the fight anyway, so I have to wait for the cycle to finish, then I can land one single hit before he goes off screen again. At least Metal Sonic let me sneak two or three in there, but you know what? His fight gets repeated too. In all fairness, Sonic 3 didn't have the most mind-blowing boss design either but it was better than this. Thankfully, like I said, the true final boss delivers all the goods we need. We get a cutscene of metal absolutely demolishing our heroes, just straight bodies them. It's honestly kind of violent. He steals the negative energy from the Chaos Emeralds and turns into... Dark Helmet. This design is actually based on Rocket Metal from Sonic the Fighters. Quite the obscure pick, although the colors have been changed, and I think I would have preferred if he kept his original blue. Knack and Knuckles step in to try and do what they can, while Sonic regains the positive energy of the Emeralds. You can see how relieved and excited Tails is that his friend isn't a corpse, staring in awe at the transformation he knows he's about to witness. The two superpowers fly out to space, and the final trouble begins. Instead of chasing down a runaway robot and luring its own attacks into itself, we have a multi-layered boss fight, in many ways surpassing the Doomsday Zone, and in others maybe not as much. I immediately discovered a massive exploit where you can hang back the whole fight collecting a net gain of rings, which completely undoes the point of having a timed supersonic fight to begin with. Quickly changing lanes to dodge meteors and grab rings is of no concern here. Anytime the going gets rough, you can chill out and regain your composure with extreme ease, taking the risk out of a system that lives and dies by the risk it carries. Simply reducing the amount on screen or making rings become less common over time could go a long way. Or something more unique, like having rings fly out of the boss after landing a hit. This would not only add incentive to attack, but also present you with a few considerations to make on the spot. Do I keep wailing on the boss, or should I grab more rings? But if I do try to grab them and I fail, 
I'll end up with even less than when I started. Then again, if I go for damage, I could still end up getting hit and losing more anyway. These are all concerns you need to weigh in on that get washed away when you can kick back at a moment's notice. I only bring so much attention to this because the actual combat is really good, so the stakes should rival the intensity. I will destroy you. Yeah, hold that thought metal, I just need a few more rings. He starts by throwing a mix of what look like... snowballs? Yeah, not your best idea. Which you have to bounce back into him six times, and three fireballs that knock you back. In the second phase, his shield goes down, so you have to hit him directly while he shoots larger fireballs, big energy waves, and a clock tower scissorman attack that takes away five rings. The first instance of damage you can receive in the fight. All the while, the background is descending into the atmosphere, getting closer to the ground. The only annoyance I have is that getting knocked back doesn't grant any iframes, since you're not really taking damage. Now that makes sense, but it means that you can get double pushed by the same projection. There are few things in games that irritate me more than getting hit and having no time to avoid being hit by the exact same thing a second time. It's a unique frustration that awakens something primal in me. Luckily, I can get good and never have to deal with it, but doesn't mean it's not there. Eight hits later and Metal undergoes another transformation by using nearby machinery to build himself up into the unused Sonic Extreme design from Metal Sonic Mark III. Doesn't look anything like the character anymore, but the sprite work is amazing all the same. Now he attacks by launching his drill hands in a boomerang arc one by one and then releasing three blue energy blasts. All of which cause damage now, so there's an escalation at play. Touching his body will knock you back, but only if you miss hitting the core, his new weak point. It's during this time where you'll have fully descended just just above the water, really giving you a sense for how fast you're moving. It's a great setting. Eight more hits and he accrues more tech to become even larger. Jeez, metal. The drill attack is gone in favor of constant energy blasts. I think they could have snuck one more attack in here to drive that final phase home, but the sheer size of this metallic lad picks up the slack. Another eight hits totaling at 30 across the whole fight. You really had to one-up Fallen Star, didn't you? And we end with a Dragon Ball Z beam struggle. Alright, look, Sonic, you can't copy Super Saiyan, Kamehameha, and After Images all at once. You're going to jail. As a boss fight? This beats the Doomsday Robot. It has four phases, 30 hits total, a myriad of attacks, dynamic scenery, and builds on the rivalry between Sonic and Metal. However, the stakes and immersion are higher in Sonic 3. If the ring acquisition gets balanced, double hitting goes away, and maybe add an extra attack or two for good measure, I think we'd have Sonic's best true final boss on our hands. There's no hypersonic though, I should make that clear. In fact, there are only six emeralds to collect since Eggman has the last one until you take it from him at the end. Meaning that you can't use supersonic on your first playthrough. A strange limitation when I first saw it, but understood once I discovered how quickly I collected all the emeralds. The giant rings are back and very intuitive to find, becoming more scarce as the game goes on. But that never became an issue because you can retry special stages with an extra life. Finally. The perfect system has been found. One-ups get to keep their inherent value tied to death, but given that most Sonic games aren't going to kill you until the very end, they have an added value of retrying the optional content where difficulty is streamlined. You know, I really wouldn't have minded Hypersonic returning for this, partly because it's a Sonic 3 sequel, and unofficial games are the only place we're going to see him again, but it would also mean we'd get a whole second set of special stages. A feature I would dive right into because they are fantastic. And I beat them all by the second zone, so it would have been nice to have more to chew on throughout the game. Next to CD and Mania, I think I've found my new favorite. It's a race against Fang to get the Emerald. Rings increase your timer, lightning bolts damage Fang, stalling him a couple seconds, and the course is riddled with hazards to slow you down, or assist you like the dash panels. I really like how there are two major threats, beating Fang and the time limit. On occasion, you'll have to make a choice between do I need more time or do I shock that Cretan because he's gonna win. Paths can split, reaction time gets more strict, and Fang becomes faster every time. There was one part where the plane obscured my vision, but beyond that, I had a blast and my failures were crystal clear. I really just think there should have been more. By the time it starts getting hard, I've already got half the emeralds. And you can't replay them in the main menu again. I'm waiting for someone to break that curse. I know this is completely out of the question, but I would lose my mind if Metal Sonic had a playable super transformation as his Mark III design. Collect enough rings and you can turn into the big version, destroying the level like a mega mushroom. It's not gonna happen. Unless. Absurd, but totally epic fantasies aside, Sonic Triple Trouble's 16-bit remake is a must-play for any classic fan. If Three & Knuckles is your favorite game of all time, or at least your favorite game in the series, I doubt this will top it for you, but you're gonna have a good time. This is a project that understands what makes the formula work, often matching and even surpassing the source material in a lot of ways. Five years of development time 
and it shows. I do hope something can be done about the physics and select boss fights that I found problematic. Trust me, I hate being that guy who's like, yo, five years, that's great, can you do more? But these are legitimate concerns that detracted from the quality, and I don't want all that hard work to be undermined by something so singular. Luckily, the game is still really good, so I'm gonna play it some more. Congratulations to the devs, and good luck on the patches. Thank you guys so much for watching, and as always, don't forget to check out the next episode whenever I post it, which will probably be soon. Alright. See ya.